to the Black Table. We're here at the Black Star Network. My name is Greg Carr, your host. And each week we take a topic, an author, a conversation, a theme, and do a little bit of a deeper dive to help the community stay informed. This week, we have decided to focus on a topic that is making headlines all over the world and has had gained renewed interest here in the United States, the topic of reparations. We know that the first recorded case of reparations for uh, slavery in the United States in terms of a legal petition uh, was the former slave Belinda Royal, enslaved African in 1783 in the form of a pension. And the reparations fight, which began on the shores of Africa, persists to this day. We've all heard of Special Order 15, the 40 acres and a mule uh, order in South Carolina. I'm sure that many people have found renewed interest because of the work of ta Coates in the Atlantic Magazine, the case for reparations. And you may have even heard of recent conversations in California about the possibility of extending reparations. And so we're going to talk about all of that and more today with two long distance runners in the long reparations movement. They inherited this movement from generations of African people who have struggled for reparations over the centuries, particularly in the United States. Women like Queen Mother Moore and Callie House, uh, men like Amari Ob Obadeli, and so many others. So we are joined today by Queen Mother Mashariki Jawanza, who is the female co-chair of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. Uh, she is an educator. She is an activist. She is a community leader. Um, she, when we first met each other, she was working for the Indianapolis Public Schools in the Office of Multicultural Education, where she did curriculum development, leadership development, among many other things. Uh, welcome, Mashariki. And we will also be joined by Sister Nkichi Taifa, founder and principal of the Taifa Group, uh, activist attorney, Black Power advocate, community organizer, the sister who convened the Justice Roundtable, senior fellow, the Center for Justice at Columbia University. Uh, she has worked with the ACLU. She's president of the DC chapter of the National Council of Black Lawyers. Uh, also served as Legislative Commission co-chair for NCOBRA, the National Coalition of Black Reparations, and also serves on the National African American Reparations Commission. Also the author of the recent memoir, Black Power, Black Lawyer. So we are joined today. I had to hold it up. It's a very important book. Get this book. Sister Nkichi Taifa and Queen Mother Mashariki Jawanza, welcome to the Black Table. Thrilled to be here with you, Professor Carl and Queen Mother Mashariki. <laughs> Same, Sante Sana. I'm honored to be uh, to be here. I think it's the first time you've ever introduced me, uh, Kamapi. Yeah, yeah, formally, formally. <laughs> formally, I, I introduce you. Yeah, no, well, we, we, we go back and forth. I tell you what, just before COVID, everyone, uh, these two sisters uh, were reached out to by Columbia University, and they went to Columbia University for a conversation on reparations. And uh, one of the reasons that uh, they were contacted and asked to come and join this conversation is because it's become popular, this topic, as we said. So let's just jump right into it. Um, let's just jump right into it. When we think about reparations, uh, what what are we talking about? Uh, Mashriki, maybe you want to go first, and then Nikichi, you can jump in. When we say reparations, what should people know? Uh, I always like to start from the beginning. Uh, the fact that we were stolen as Africans uh, through uh, human trafficking. We were brought to these shores as Africans. Uh, and I'd like to uh, always remind us, we're still Africans. Uh, and so what reparations is about is uh, for uh, this country and other countries to pay the debt that is owed for all the uh, uh, awful things that they had done, because we all know that uh, kidnapping is a crime, murder is a crime, rape is a crime, and they've committed all of these things uh, uh, upon our people uh, for numerous of years. Um, I also like to point out, you know, we're talking about the history uh, to always uh, dispel the myth that uh, African people are responsible for our enslavement. We are not. Uh, we have always resisted. We have always fought. Uh, you'd have to go to Africa uh, and talk to uh, our people there who talk about uh, the ancestors that died on those shores defending us uh, and trying to uh, 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 keep us. Were there collaborators? Of course there were. We still have them today. You know, uh, uh, there's always collaborators, but the majority of our people fought 
uh, uh, to keep us. Uh, but here we are today uh, um, with the theme of reparations still uh, in, in the air uh, because of the, the people here, the government here has never owned up to its crimes. And uh, uh, we are saying that you have committed a crime against the people and we're not gonna stop with our demands that we are paid for our labor. That's what Callie House was doing. I mean, I'm just, I was just so amazed when I, I found out about her uh, right after the enslavement uh, period in the, I call them concentration camps uh, that she was in, her and Isaiah Dickerson uh, walked this land. They didn't have no cars or, or anything. They walked this land and they were able to organize over 400,000 people right after the enslavement period. And how they wanted was pension for the older folks, because I think many of us don't realize once the enslavement period was supposedly over, uh, a good deal of the people that were uh, freed, so-called, were elderly people. And so Callie House and Isaiah Dickerson and their organization, you know, uh, went throughout this land and uh, uh, people paid 25 cents. Of course, it ended up being their demise because the uh, uh, government accused them of mail fraud, same thing they did to Marcus Garvey, and uh, uh, imprisoned uh, Callie House. So, you know, we, we have this history. Uh, uh, reparations and the demand for reparations is not new. It just didn't pop up a few years ago. It, ha it has been here. And uh, I really um, uh, like to credit uh, 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 Sister Nkichi uh, Baba Hannibal, uh, Imari Obadeli, uh, uh, Adra Artor, uh, and all the ones who formed a Queen Mother Moore in Cobra, uh, which has put it on the modern stage. And uh, 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 we're continuing their work. That, that's our job. Uh, as long as I'm here, everyone that I had named worked for reparation until they died. And they passed that on uh, to me. And I have no choice but to do so. Thank you, Queen Mother. Uh, in Kichi, we heard uh, Mashriki talk about that narrative history of reparations before the Civil War, as we mentioned in the introduction, but then picking up with that ex-slave mutual relief and pension fund. Uh, folks can read Mary Frances Berry's book, My Face is Black is too True. You want to know more about Callie House and Isaiah Dickerson and that, and that fund. But she brought it right up into the 20th century with the Garveyites and the Garvey movement, and of course, mentioning Queen Mother Audley Moore. Could you, because uh, neither one of you are nearly young enough to participate in, uh, old enough to participate in any of those movements, but you inherited this baton from a great many of the uh, uh, the folks that Mashariki mentioned. Could you say a little bit about uh, how this reparations movement saw a resurgence in the 1960s when you she mentioned Amari Obadelli and the Republic of New Africa and so much and so much you write about in Black Power, Black Lawyer. Could, could you take us through how the modern reparation movement emerges out of the 60s? Some of yes. what you participated in. Yes, thank you so very much. And thank you, Queen Mother, for um, for that very uh, illustrious uh, history. And you spoke about Queen Mother more because she is the one who actually ushered mm -hmm. the reparations movement into uh, the current era, I guess you could say. She started with the Garvey movement, but she became active in every single reparations movement until her death. I think it was in 1996 or 1997. Uh, she formed in the 50s the, the, the Ethiopian Women's Association and other groups calling for reparations. She called for um, um, payment for the genocide that we have been suffering. She influenced the civil rights movement. She influenced the South African anti-apartheid movement. She influenced the black power movement. She was the influencer with respect to the Republic of New Africa, the Black Panther Party. Many of these organizations during the 60s, in fact, Every single organization, a uh, black nationalist, black power movement during the uh, 60s had as part of their platform, their 10 point program or whatever platform they had, the issue of reparations or restitution. I remember myself being influenced by the Black Panther Party's newspaper. I'm 16 years old, selling Black Panther paper newspapers on the streets of Washington, DC, looking at their point number three, you know, dealing with restitution. Mm -hmm. for mass murder and enslavement of black people. Uh, the Republic of New Africa in 1968, in its Declaration of Independence stated that we claim no rights from the United States other than those rights belonging to oppressed people anywhere in the world. And these include the right to damages, reparations, do us 
for the grievous injuries sustained by ourselves and our ancestors by reason of U.S. lawlessness. And I know this, like we learned, wrote the Declaration, the, the um, uh, Pledge of Allegiance and all like that. I learned uh, our history, uh, mm -hmm. what we call New African uh, political science at the feet of these elders, such as Imario Bedelli and Chokwe Lumumba, and Queen Mother Moore, and, and the like. And you had organizations, the Nation of Islam, the African People's Socialist Party. We have organizations, the National Black United up front. We have civil rights groups. We have James Foreman, the senior, not the junior who is currently a professor at Yale, but the senior, James Foreman, interrupting Sunday service mm -hmm. at my church calling for payment for these past harms. And actually, some of the churches did, in fact, mm -hmm. pay into a fund that was there around that time. You had Dr. Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, he was talking about um, coming to Washington to cash that check. And yes, I know it sounds yeah. metaphoric, okay? But he believed in uh, uh, recompense, amends for the harms that had been um, that had been done. But what actually brought the reparations movement into what I call the actual modern era was the founding of Nkoba, of which Queen Mother Marshmiki serves currently as female co-chair, the National Coalition of Blacks for oh, Reparations gosh, in yeah. America, 1987 founding. Mm -hmm. I was at that founding uh, convention called for by the president of the Republic of New Africa, Mario Bedelli, upon the urging of Sister Queen Mother Dorothy Lewis, who had an organization called the Black Reparations Commission, a brick, and all of us were, it, 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 you know, coming together saying, you know, we gotta do something about all of this madness. So Brother Imari was the one who issued the formal call for reparations loving people from across the country to come to Washington, D.C. and to talk about, at that time it was, an independent black foreign policy and a domestic reparations program here. And that was the birth of NCOBRA. And, you know, it wasn't like everybody was of one mind. Some people were saying, "Sure, well, we don't necessarily need to follow a commission because at that time, the, um, uh, the, the Japanese Americans were in the process of um, struggling for their reparations for their undue incarceration during World War II. And in 1988, that bill passed the Civil mm -hmm. Liberties Act, which granted reparations to Japanese Americans. And we looked around and in COBA, which has been started a year early, and said, if they could give reparations to Japanese right, Americans, right. surely for sure. all these centuries of sure. our um, uh, uh, my offer, trauma, yeah. you know, genocide, they can give reparations to us. So I'll conclude yeah. it you know, at that particular point. Well, but that was the birth of Encova. Well, let's pause. This is actually just, we're going to take a quick break. And mm -hmm. when we come back, let's pick up right there with the founding of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. Because what you've both done, Mashriki uh, and uh, Nkichi brilliantly, is frame this in an international Pan-African uh, perspective. So mm -hmm. we'll, when we return, we'll pick up right where we left off. Uh, the Black Table, Black Star Network, back in a moment. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. We're back at the Black Table. Greg Carr joined by Nkichi Taifa and Mashriki Jawanza on the subject of reparations. And I'm sure that folks are pausing this, taking notes. You are getting the primer you need <laughs> to be able to have an informed conversation about this. So we know that it didn't start with an article in The Atlantic by our brother Tanaisi Coates. It didn't start with the recent uh, social media phenomena known as the American descendants of slavery. And it didn't start uh, with any of the uh, kind of sensationalistic debates and conversations taking place. This is a long range movement. And Kishi, when we left, 
you had brought us to the founding of Encobra, of course, and you and uh, Mashariki, of course, long time founding, grounding members of Encobra and leaders in Encobra. Um, we, we know now that shortly, uh, well, around that same time, and I guess this we might call that nation, this now calls their history, the Detroit history, Detroit playing this outsized role. Could you talk a little bit about the piece of federal legislation that just left committee, H.R. 40, and some of its roots and some of those stalwarts in uh, Detroit, like reparations, Ray Jenkins, and of course, Congressman John Conyers. Mm -hmm. Give us the roots of, for those of uh, those watching, you know that there is a reparation study bill uh, that is working its way through Congress. Could either of you give us some of that Detroit history and talk about where H.R. 40 came from and what it, what, what it really is? Okay. If uh, if it's okay with Nkichi, I I will start and and then I will like uh, you know she can bring us up on where we are where we are now and we are at a very historical place, you know. But um, uh, uh, and maybe I really should let her do it because she was there. Uh, I came into Encobra a few years uh, uh, after all this got started, but uh, the person I met was Reparations Ray, who was constantly constantly talking about. Uh, 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 reparations and constantly uh, telling his friend, John Conyers, you need to produce a bill. You need to bring forth a bill. And again, uh, and Kichi can fill in the, uh, of the details of that. And so when I came in, that's what we were doing. We were moving towards H.R. Uh, uh, 40 uh, as, as well as uh, another lawsuit that was, that was in the works. Uh, and that came about and was always on the table. Reparations Ray made sure uh, not only, you know, uh, we say all the time, it doesn't matter what you say is what you do as to who you are. And Reparations Ray raised the money. He raised the money for us to have a lawsuit. He raised the money for us to push H.R. 40. Uh, and he did that until he died. And uh, we have uh, nothing but respect for for. Uh, uh, Congressman Conyers, because he kept it going over 20 some years. He kept it going. And here we are now with, uh, I think, about 218 signatures on that. And we uh, still have a lot of work. He's a congressional co sponsor, 218 so far. Yes, 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 yes. We still have, have a lot of work to do. And I know Nkichi's been uh, right in the midst uh, uh, of that work. So I'll let her bring us on up to where we are. You help us, Nkichi. In fact, uh, I remember a talk you gave a couple of years ago at your beloved Howard University School of Law, where you served, of course, for many years on the faculty and were the founding director of the Equal Justice Program. And you really walked us through this multi-pronged strategy, community activists and community workers, but also battles in the courtroom. You know, it's fascinating as, as I'm sitting here listening to you, mm -hmm. sisters, how many black women are involved in this? When you mentioned <laughs> Aju Aju Toro, when you mentioned yourself as lawyers, because help us understand this multi-pronged strategy and where HR 40 fits in it. Okay, so thank you um, very much. So it is multi-pronged strategy because it, we're not a monolithic uh, people. And even when uh, HR 40 was, HR 40 was patterned directly off of the Japanese American Redress uh, Bill, which first called for a commission to study uh, the issue. And then it was to develop um, uh, proposals. The strategy was not 100% agreed upon by all the reparations loving people who came. Some folks some folk were saying, we don't need a commission to study. We already know what this issue is. And then other people were saying, well, this is the way the Japanese did it. If we go exactly that way, there's no way they can counter us our mm -hmm. uh, demands. And so uh, those who disagree, we just agree respectfully to disagree. And those of us who agree to go along with the approach with Congressman John Conyers did, but it never devolved into disrespect or name calling or any of the, some of these things that we're seeing cropping up um, now. We um, principally agree to, let's see how, how this goes. And so it was a strategy and it was a very successful strategy. Why do I say that? Because during that time, it's not like it is now where it's sexy and fashionable and hip to talk about reparations. Mm -hmm. You know, back then it was fringe. And it was um, uh, difficult to even get people to feel comfortable even just mouthing the word reparations. We were really in a different time then. So I said the strategy was successful because calling for a commission to just study the issue during those early 
days allow in Cobra to really mainstream the reparations movement. It wasn't confined within the black power, black nationalist um, uh, arena of which I came in came of age of, but it expanded to sororities and fraternities and religious and faith organizations and uh, civil rights, the largest civil rights and civil liberties uh, community because it was easy. How could you disagree with just a commission just to study? And as I told ta when he was writing his article, HR 40 did not give one red cent to anyone. It was just a commission to study the issue. And so it allowed us to have quite a number of proliferation of municipalities across the country. I'm not talking about within the last two years. I'm talking about 25 to 30 years. Right. Ago. Walk us through that. Yeah. Let, let, let the people right. know. Uh, Y'all let the people know. To yeah. Illinois, all, all over the country, you had cities endorsing HR 40. They were right. endorsing the concept of a commission to study. So right. that helped to build the momentum. California, what's going on today, didn't just drop from the sky. Right. Evanston, Illinois, with the reparations that they are giving out, right, did not just drop from the sky. It dropped from 25 to 30 years earlier when legislators upon the, um, 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 the urgence an inspiration of Incobra says, yes, we can get on board with a commission mm -hmm. to study the issue. So what's come happening now is simply a continuation of what happened before. You know, it's interesting as you talk, and, and again, and we're going to have to have you all back because there are so many figures that people know, names they know that they wouldn't connect to the reparations movement. I mean, mm -hmm. working in John Kanye's office, we know was Rosa Parks. There's the connection to the Republic of New Africa in Mississippi. When you mentioned Illinois, the Illinois Slave Trade Commission, Conrad Ruel, and so many others, the city of Philadelphia, New York, so many places. And Kichi, is so important. Um, either you or Omar Shariki, help us understand how this long struggle uh, was not only considered perhaps fringe in some ways, but was met with open opposition. Think about the state of Mississippi or the city of Jackson, the federal government, political prisoners, folks. I mean, you know, like you said, it's sexy now. But what what was the cost that many of these reparations activists paid for their advocacy? Well, uh, you know, when you uh, look at it, Brother Kamati, uh, we've always had this uh, 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 resistance to, uh, to our freedom. We've always had it. This, this, this government, all branches of government have, have, have been against that. Uh, but I wanted to mention, uh, I want to get to your point, but uh, uh, in case you mentioned uh, Dorothy uh, Benton Lewis. Yes. Uh, a, a, a true champion. Uh, Dorothy really brought me into the reparations movement back in the early 70s. And uh, uh, she never stopped, she never wavered. Uh, and so those main streams that we were able to bring in, the sororities, the churches, it, it, Dor that was Dorothy's mission. <laughs> and Dorothy used to say all the time, we are gonna get reparations in, in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I believed her, uh, you know, and I worked alongside her and uh, no one worked any harder than, than Dorothy. Uh, as I had mentioned, some of the other uh, uh, ancestors that we have, everybody worked for reparations until they died. Mm -hmm. They never stopped. You know, not not once. Uh, Baba Obadeli was 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 ill. He was coming to every board meeting, raising hell. You know, trying to get us to understand that it's the grassroots people that we got to get to. That that we have to get to listen to us. We have to have programs for our people. Um, and uh, as well as Brother Hannibal, who uh, 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 got his land, had survival trainings for families to prepare us. In this fact, uh, in Cobra's, uh, yeah, in Cobra's uh, convention is coming up uh, in June, June 23rd through the 25th in New England. Uh, and we're going to be talking about uh, how do you prepare for reparations? You know, uh, and what needs to be in place. And we need uh, uh, organizations uh, that have reparations platforms to come in and uh, share what they have. Because that's what, as Nkichi said, that's what NCOBRA has always been about, trying to pull together those organizations that have a reparations platform. We don't have to agree on everything. Do we agree that reparations are due? Do yeah. we agree that we need to demand reparations for our people? Uh, um, as long as we can agree to those things, uh, we should be able to work out 
uh, uh, anything else that, that stands in our in our way. Well, l- let's pause here for a moment. And when we come back, let's talk about the landscape of today. We know that there is legislation empowering a California panel to make recommendations to the California legislature. We know that there has been a local reparations movement. And as Impeachy mentioned, Evanston, Illinois being probably the most prominent uh, place that has kind of made recent headlines. Let's talk about this contemporary edu- uh, reparations movement in that context. So we'll be back in a moment, joined by Nkichi Taifa and Mashariki Jawanza here at the Black Tape. Back in a moment. I'm Dr. Jackie Hood-Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We're back at the Black Table, the Black Star Network, and we continue our conversation on reparations with Nkichi Taifa and Mashariki Jawanza. Nkichi, given the thrust that you all have led us through, we've now seen a, a burst of interest in reparations and another wave of movement. And this wave of movement, while certainly building on the momentum of the long reparations movement, there are some other elements that have come into uh, into view. And I think about our sister Jam Aminor, and I think about the fact when you all convened in New York to create the National African American uh, Reparations uh, Group, uh, certainly Ron Daniels playing a, a major role in that, another longtime reparations activist. Could you talk to us a little bit about what's going on in California, what's going on in Evanston, Asheville, places like that, local reparations? How do you read this uh, this current interest in reparations and the push certainly legislatively to try to secure reparations for us. Okay, well, it's a direct flow from the inactivity of H.R. 40 over the past 30 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, While state and local uh, municipalities have been um, picking up uh, the banner, the federal bill uh, has not had a vote on the full floor. Just recently, there was a vote in committee, which was Mm -hmm. phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And as Queen Mother said, there are now more committed co-sponsors than ever. There are actually 216 committed votes. Uh, but what's happening across the uh, country is that folks said, we're not gonna necessarily wait on the federal uh, government. We can and must start doing this now. The federal government was not the only culpable party. There was also um, a state and local municipalities, religious institutions, academic institutions, industries, corporations, private uh, estates. So all of these culpable parties need to have redress. So the state of California recently passed a, a, a bill pattern off of HR 40 mm-hmm. for, um, California a, AB 3121. They are engaged in historic hearings right now. Prior to that, the city of Evanston, Illinois used a very creative strategy using tax dollars from their legal cannabis industry to fund reparatory justice initiatives uh, that they deemed um, essential in uh, in that jurisdiction. Across the country, there are commissions just popping up from yeah. Asheville, uh, uh, North Carolina, to Massachusetts, to Vermont, to um, uh, 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 in, in Missouri, Chicago, uh, uh, Minnesota. I mean, the list, the list is growing almost uh, daily. Uh, there is a danger, though, and the danger is similar to the danger that happened with Callie House and with mm. Marcus Garvey and with the Mario Bedelli. The, the, the activity, the activism uh, in the past, and hopefully we, we, we I, I, I'm seeing um, rumblings in the current, is being criminalized. And, um, oh, interesting. What do you mean by that? Uh, 
Well, uh, if folk remember the COINTELPO, the FBI's mm -hmm. secret, uh, one secret illegal campaign to disrupt and destroy the movement. They don't talk about reparations as part of that, but the people that they were targeting, the Absolutely. groups, the organizations, the right. Black Panther Party, the Republican New Africa, the right. Nation of Islam, right. all have reparations as part of their platform. As Queen Mother said, Kelly House went to prison advocating for reparation. Mm -hmm. Marcus Garvey went to prison for advocating for uh, repatriation, not swimming in the ocean naked, but yes. with, with, with you know, amends from, from yes. the U.S. Uh, uh, government. And there are forces going on now that we don't, maybe 50 years from now, we might see exactly what was going on and what was happening, but there are disruptive forces happening uh, now that the ascendancy of reparations has taken center for reparations is on fire it's spreading across the country and we must not allow that fire to be uh extinguished well, let, let's try this together actually this is good for both of you um you, you struck on something mashri uh, um, and kichi that is very important i thought about you and mashriki in the same moment because i think about i guess what 20 21 years ago the world conference against racism in the fall of 2001 where the delegation from the United States and uh, was able to push through uh, not only reparations language, but the the, the assertion that this uh, we African people are subject to genocide, even in the United States. We saw that in Crime 1951. Crime against humanity. Absolutely. I, I guess I'm thinking about this in the context of the recent uh, hearings in California, where the study commission recommended to the California legislature that let that reparations be restricted to those who could prove that they had an ancestor enslaved in the United States. So including, I mean, excluding African people who came here after enslavement. And what you just laid out for us really raises a question in my mind for either of you. And that is, you know, what is the value of the struggle for reparations in the United States being linked to these international reparations struggles. What, what have either of you seen and experienced as, as the strengthening of local reparations demands in terms of a, of a U.S. demand by connecting it to these international reparations movements? Well, the, the international connection is extremely important uh, because, as I said, uh, they uh, kidnapped us as Africans. They scattered us all over the world. Uh, 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 more Africans uh, uh, in Brazil, outside of Africa, than than any any other place. Uh, and as as a result of that, you know, we are we are bound by our oppression. Hmm. Uh, um, and uh, uh, there needs to be uh, uh, payment. There needs to be recognition uh, 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 of the pain uh, that has been. Uh, forced upon us as a people all over this world. And so that, that that's our connection as, as a people. Now, Brother Hannibal F. Freak tells us that people here in the United States has to go, uh, 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 have to gain their reparations from the people here. People in Brazil have to gain their reparations from the people there. But we support that. You know, we work very closely with the reparations movement uh, in London. Uh, uh, Sister Esther uh, 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 champions that. Um, and I wanted to just speak briefly, and I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Nkichi about this this lineage. You know, there's there's nothing wrong with uh, finding out your, your lineage, uh, but when you base reparations only on that, you know, you displace a lot of people because we all, it's, it's the obscenity that our history has not been recorded that we can't go back to understand where, where we're from. Uh, and to use that as the only basis for reparations, you really are displacing uh, 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 many, many of our people. And for, uh, for folk who might not know, when you say lineage, of course, we think about uh, scholars like Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullen down in North Carolina and many others who are advocating that lineage you have to prove your descent from an enslaved person in the united states in order to file any potential claim for reparations is that how you understand lineage to operate oh uh, that's how i understand they are interpreting it you know uh, but <laughs> right <laughs> uh, and i'm saying that uh um uh we're not limiting uh, uh the, our fight for reparations to, to just that group uh no one is saying that you you shouldn't find out where you come from for those that can that's great 
Um, uh, but we have, you know, we, we need uh, institution building. You know, uh, we have to teach our people about self-reliance uh, and, and how to take care of themselves without being so dependent on these folks that we have been dependent on for all these years. Um, uh, there's so many things. Uh, we talked about what's going on in Evanston with the cannabis piece. Who has looked at all our brothers and sisters still in jail yes. for possession of marijuana? Yes. While these white folks are out here making millions selling legally yes. marijuana. And so, you know, that that's a reparations case, yes. you know, um, and, uh, uh, you know, that's what we have to do. We have to bring attention to those things that uh, uh, they are using, you know, uh, to keep us down. After all these years, you know, they still, they still feel the need, you know, to, put, to keep their foot on our neck. And so, you know, we have a lot of work to do with our young people to understand uh, their role in uh, understanding who they are and that, you know, self-determination and self-reliance is uh, uh, where we have to be as a people. So we'll, we'll take our final break. Thank you, Mashariki. And when we come back uh, in Kichi, maybe from there you can uh, open our discussion in terms of where you see the reparations movement going forward from where we are right now, now that it has achieved a renewed prominence. Hmm. And we will pick up with that conversation in a moment after we take this brief break here at the Black Star Network with the Black Table. Back in a moment. It's time to be smart. Roland Martin's doing this every day. Oh, no punches! Thank you, Roland Martin, for always giving voice to the issues. Look for Roland Martin in the whirlwind, to quote Marcus Garvey again. The video looks phenomenal, so I'm really excited to see it on my big screen. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. I got to defer to the brilliance of Dr. Carr and to the brilliance of the Black Star Network. I am rolling with rolling all the way. Honored to be on a show that you own, a black man owns the show. Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Like, wow. Rolling was amazing on that. Stay black. I love y'all. I can't commend you enough about this platform that you've created for us to be able to share who we are, what we're doing in the world, and the impact that we're having. Let's be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You can't be black on media and be scared. You dig? back with our final segment here at the Black Table, joined uh, this week by Mashariki Juwanza, the female co-chair of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, and Nkichi Taifa, founder and principal of the Taifa Group, and a founding member of Encobra, and so many other, uh, so many other battles that she's waged over the years. And Kichi, help us understand, because you have been nonstop over cross platforms making these arguments. And again, the legal arguments just fascinate me how uh, a lot of folks are relying on law that isn't anywhere in the Constitution and that, in fact, is judge made law. And, and I wonder what goes through your mind as you look at where we are now, whether it be H.R. 40 or the California proposed uh, reparations model or the local reparations movement. Survey for us, if you can, in a thumbnail, where you see the reparations movement going from here. Well, one of the things is that we really need some creative legal minds. You know, we cannot rely on the master's tool to dismantle the master's house. I think that quote came from Audrey uh, uh, Lloyd. We need we need people like me, who I was 30, 40 years ago, young, curious, innovative no. minds to, <laughs> um, uh, to be able to not uh, uh, sweep our claims under the rug, not say, well, because the Supreme Court says you can't use race, then we're not going to use race. We're just, a, you know, we, we have to come up with our own strategies. We have to demand that international law uh, shape things around how we want them to be, as opposed to us always looking at what other groups have done and enshrined in international law. Our struggles need to be enshrined there 
as uh, well. At this stage now, where we've gone beyond people being comfortable mouthing the word, people are very comfortable with it now. We need our strong minds to come together and look at exactly what does reparations look like. Mm -hmm. And as Narc says, no amount of monetary resources will ever uh, um, compensate for everything that we've been through. And I might add, it's not just about closing the black white wealth gap. Mm -hmm. That's not mm -hmm. the only harm. That was a huge harm. But then Copa has five injury areas of which yeah. Queen Mother uh, spoke of once in terms of one in terms of the criminal punishment system. And you have the black white wealth gap and you have the health disparities, mm -hmm. and you have the educational inequities and you have the peoplehood, <laughs> the nationhood. And each one of those needs to be addressed. So that's what I see Professor Grant Carr going into the future, looking at each of those injury areas and determining just what the amends for that will be. And again, it's not just in monetary dollars. I'm not saying that's not a part of it. I personally feel it is and should yes. be, but it's much, 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 much more, much more. Much more, much more. And uh, Kamafi, can I uh, mention, because you had mentioned um, uh, the World Conference Against Racism. Now, one thing in terms of this whole international connection, uh, 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 we were there and we talked to our people all over the world. And we discovered, not, not that it was, you know, uh, uh, not in front of our face, you know, we all have been oppressed. You know, we, we, we all are in, in, in the same boat you know, uh, uh, with the same conditions, wherever we were. And and so there was a unity that, that came together among the people. And really, we were fired up, ready to go. Hmm. And then, of course, as you know, while we were there, 9-11 happened. Uh, and yeah, that was, I think that's, that's, that, that's critically important for people to understand. Had it not been for 9-11-2001, that World Conference Against Racism, I think, yeah. would, have, would have been much more prominent in the imagination. So you're saying while y'all were in South Africa, mm -hmm. huh? Yeah. What kind of, and, and as we know, of course, Colin Powell, Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice, National Security Advisor, the United States government came out in opposition to much of oh, what they, they all walked they all walked out it was embarrassing to, to, to even have to admit that you come from the uh, the united states and here's some progressive things were were trying to uh, uh happen you know uh we we had we had so many uh uh issues i had a, a sister that i know that was in the european block and uh they tormented that lady uh, uh because she would not vote uh, uh for israel um so it, I mean, I, I learned a lot in terms of what our people are going through uh, uh, throughout the world. And, and, and guess what? We all have the same types of, uh, of issues. We are being treated as we always have been treated, you know, uh, uh, less than. Um, and so uh, I think we're saying now in terms of the future reparations, hey, uh, uh, we are more than, uh, and we are going to demand what is rightfully ours. You know, acknowledge your mistake. Uh, 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 you know, they just damn fools. But they almost they could have been done with this. They could have done forty acres and a mule. <laughs> you know, it's it's so much that could have been done. But you know, they're so determined to keep us down, uh, so, which is why we've got to the, the the future is to organize our young people, uh, for them to understand again who they are and what uh, self reliance and self respect uh, uh, is all about. And I look forward to uh, continuing this movement with these young people. Uh, and I am uh, optimistic that uh, and hopeful that uh, uh, we will see reparations in our lifetime, as uh, Dorothy Lewis Benton has, has has said. Yes. Well, we're almost out of time. I do uh, you erase really? the <laughs> oh, no. oh, yeah, it was so fast. Don't worry, we're going to come back. I mean, that's the beautiful thing about Black Star Network uh, is black owned. So we can always come. We need to have this conversation again. I'm hoping that uh, that Mashariki, what you raised is so important in terms of the value of reparations for our people and also just in terms of society. As you said, they could have been done with this. I I Kichi, when people say, well, you giving this to black people, how does this benefit me? How does reparations yeah. benefit society generally in your man, in your mind? Well, I just want to say something first is that yeah, yeah, it's not like the United States hasn't paid reparations 
They paid reparations to the white folks in 1862, right. pursuant to the DC Compensated Emancipation Act. They didn't pay it to us, like Marshall right. said. They paid it to the white folks. Wait, 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 wait hold on, hold on, Mr. Counselor. Yeah. Somebody may have missed that. You saying that there was there was reparations paid somewhere in this country during yeah. enslavement, but not yeah. to the people who were enslaved? Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. It was provided as incentive to the white folk to um to free us. They paid them to free us. Not only that, I recently found out that in 1892, the descendants of 11 Italian lynching victims in New Orleans received cash reparations from the United States government. So it's not like this is a foreign concept. I'm, mm. I'm not even talking about the Japanese American reparations bill in um. Uh, 1988, but I'm talking about all throughout history. And then the giving of the land. They took the land from our 40 acres in the mule and they gave it to the white folks. They took, they, they did not allow us to benefit from the Homestead Act. We couldn't benefit from the GI Bill. That we were subjected to um, redlining, educational inequities, health inequities, mass incarceration, murders, lynchings, I mean, everything. But other groups get compensated, but we got affirmative action. <laughs> that was about to go away very quickly. <laughs> so well, it is old, it is due, it must be paid. Yes. And that is the only way that there will ever be any type of healing in this country. Mm, mm, thank you. Thank you. On that note, um, Mashriki Jawanza, female co chair of Encobra, and Nkichi Taifa, uh, principal and founder of the Taifa Group reparations lawyer and warrior thank you both for joining us for this all too brief hour at the black table and uh, i hope you all will come back soon so we can continue this conversation because it's only going to get more intense from here thank you both thank you both of course being a long distance runner yourself oh no i'm just uh, uh, reparations I'm, now <laughs> come to new england june 23rd 25th help us hammer it out What's the website, uh, uh, Mashri? For uh, more. In Cobra. <laughs> in Cobra Online dot org. Cobra Online dot org. And I have a website too. Oh yes, please, please. Reparation, please. Reparation Education Project dot org. Reparation no s. Reparation Education Project dot org. Reparation Education Project dot org. Yes. And e n. I'm sorry, N C O B R A online. Mm -hmm. dot org. Okay, so you all check both those websites out. That is the point of departure. Start there for your point of mm -hmm. entry into reparations. We want to thank these sisters, mm -hmm. two titans in the work of reparations, not only in the United States, but globally. Thanks again. Unity, unity is the key. Unity is definitely the key. And I shake. I shake. I shake. Back in a moment, we'll clear the tape. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Folks, Black Star Network is this. A real uh, revolutionary right now. Like, wow. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. Hey, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. You can't be Black Owned Media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Welcome back to the Black Table. We've had a powerful hour spent discussing reparations. And there are any number of quotes we could use to clear the table today. 
There are so many ancestors that were evoked today by Nkichi and Mashariki, Queen Mother Moore, Dorothy Benton Lewis, Hannibal F. Freak, Amari Obadelli, and so many others. But we all, all remember that all of these ancestors and all of these elders and all of the current warriors and future generations must always remember that while we are owed, as Mashariki said, unity is the key. And at the center of unity is reconciliation and self-repair, self-determination. That is the empowering engine that drives reparations and the reparations movement. So thank you for joining us here at The Black Table, and we'll see you next week on The Black Star Network. I'm Greg Carr, your host, and thanks again. See you soon.